Hey everybody, this video lesson is going to cover hybridization. The word hybridize in a general sense means to take two things and put them together. The new product would have qualities of the two original things that you hybridize together. You can think of yourself as a hybridization of your two parents. You've got some of your traits from your mom, some of your traits from your biological dad, and so you are a hybrid of their genetic code. So hybridization takes into account, in our case, hybridizing the orbitals, the S, P, D, and F orbitals of an electron configuration for a particular element. So let's start at the beginning. Hybridization helps explain why molecules are a given shape. Because if you think about it, and chances are many of you haven't thought about it, but Vesper shapes and the quantum mechanical model don't necessarily agree with one another when it comes to understanding the true shape of a molecule. Here's what I mean by that. Carbon is a very common atom that is located centrally in a lot of different molecules. And carbon has four valence electrons. Those valence electrons are occupying the second energy level. According to Hund's rule and all the other rules of filling electron orbitals and electron boxes, you have to put the first two electrons in the 1s orbital, and then the 2s orbital gets filled, and then finally the final two electrons go in the 2p orbital. Remember, Hund's rule says that you have to spread out the electrons one in each of these orbitals before any one orbital gets two. Aufbau's principle also says you have to fill up the lowest energy level and available energy orbital first. So you can't put one of these electrons in each one of these boxes. You have to put two in the 2s and then the remaining two go into the 2p. If you look at the available electrons that carbon has that can participate in bonding, and depending on who you ask, the definition of bonding electrons are ones that are unpaired and looking for a partner. And if that's the case, according to the quantum mechanical model, carbon only has two available electrons for bonding, and the other two are happy and stable. But we know, Vesper says, that carbon can make up to four single bonds with different four elements. And those two don't necessarily agree with each other. Vesper tells us it can make four bonds. According to quantum mechanics, it can only make two. So hybridization basically takes combining S and P orbitals into a new set of orbitals that put them all on equal standing. And that way you can spread out the electrons evenly and then explain the single bonds that elements make to the ligands. Hybridization takes into account only the electron domain geometry. And when you do that, remember, we treat lone pairs of electrons and bonding pairs of electrons equally. Let's use my example of carbon in CH4 to get us started. So over here on the left hand side, you have the traditional setup of the orbitals specifically for the carbon atom. And we're only worried about the valence electrons. So the electrons in the second energy level. Now, if I were to draw in the four electrons of carbon in the second energy level, it would look something like this with two in the two S and one in each of the two P's. As I mentioned on the last slide, this only allows for carbon to make two single bonds to any two elements. But CH4, in this example, has four single bonds to carbon. So what hybridization allows for us to do is to actually eliminate the concept of S and P orbitals alone and combine them or hybridize them into a set of four orbitals that are all on equal energy. Remember, when I say energy in terms of electron configurations, the S is closer to the nucleus than the P. So what we do is actually, and I'll use a new color, is we promote the one S orbital of the second energy level and actually demote the two P orbitals and put the S and the P on equal footing, equal distance from the nucleus. And now when you hybridize the S and the P together, you get what we call the sp3 orbitals. The sp3 orbitals are four equivalent orbitals that are all uh, available for electrons to fall into. And Hund's rule comes back in. So let's take carbon's four electrons now and put them 
into these orbitals, spreading them out one in each before any one gets two. And now we get something that is more on the lines of what Vesper is trying to tell us. Vesper tells us carbon makes four bonds to hydrogen, and each one of those bonds is equal. Now, hybridization allows us to account for these four bonds that are indeed equal. So it merges together the concepts of the quantum mechanical model and Vesper. So we call each one of these the sp3 orbitals, and there are four of them. If you want to remember how many orbitals there are in the sp3, think of this. It's s1p3, 1 plus 3 equals 4. That's how many orbitals there are when you hybridize sp3. 1s and 3p make sp3 orbitals. Hybridization not only allows for us to account for single electrons that are available to do some bonding, but it also can represent a pair of electrons that live in a hybridized orbital. And this last bullet point explains this. Hybridized orbitals don't always have to have alone electrons. They can be a lone pair. Now to illustrate this, I'm going to quickly erase all of this that I did for carbon, and we're going to imagine that they're going to do or map the electrons for oxygen in the H2O molecule or for water. And as we know, H2O looks like this, it's Lewis dot structure, and Vesper shape would say that it is bent. It's a polar molecule that's bent. Now let's focus on the oxygen. How many valence electrons does oxygen have? The answer, of course, is six. So the first two go into the first energy level. According to trad traditional quantum mechanical model thought, but in this hybridization case, instead of these six electrons occupying two in the 2s and the remaining four spread out in the 2p, rather we hybridize these orbitals and spread the six electrons out among the evenly energetic sp3 hybridized orbitals. So in other words, we go one, two, three, four, five, six. Now as we look into the hybridized orbitals of oxygen in water, we see that there are two unpaired electrons, and those are the ones that are going to participate in bonding with the hydrogen's electrons. And then the other two hybridized orbitals have a pair of electrons, which are these two here and here. So it's not only the case to hybridize in order to bond, but you can also hybridize to place a pair of electrons. And before we move on any further, I'm going to clarify. Normally, we talk about hybridization of the central atom in a molecule, but you need to very specifically explain which element you are going to be hybridizing when you're discussing hybridization. Usually, on my tests and my quizzes, we're referring to the central atom in a molecule like CH4 or H2O. But even the ligands have hybridized capabilities. Here's a closer look at the four equivalent sp3 orbitals. This picture comes right from the book. It pretty much explains what I did on the last page. Traditional quantum mechanics says that you've got one s orbital and three p orbitals in the second energy level. But hybridization says let's take s and p and p and p and put them together to create four equal orbitals. And now you see that the orbital shape is no longer spherical or dumbbell. It's almost like a lopsided dumbbell with a little spot right here and a big dumbbell on this side. And those are all situated at 109.5 degrees for one another, which is consistent with what you observe in the Vesper model of molecules. So hybridization, as I mentioned now, this will be the third time, hybridizes the concepts of quantum mechanics with Vesper by hybridizing S and P orbitals. And you might ask yourself, well, can you hybridize D orbitals and F orbitals as well? And the answer to that question is yes. And that happens when you start to expand the octet. We'll get to that near the end of this presentation. Now in this example, we're going to look at carbon once again. But instead of hybridizing all four of the orbitals, the orbitals being the 2s and the 3 2ps, 
Sometimes an element doesn't want or need to hybridize all of the orbitals and it only hybridizes a handful of them. It kind of is case by case. It depends on the molecule. And it seems backwards, but what we're really doing is looking at the shape first and then pick the hybridization second. Now in the case of some molecules, you don't want to or don't need to hybridize all of the orbitals. In this case, let's talk about the hybridization of 1s and 2p orbitals. Now again, let's talk about carbon. Typically carbon has four electrons in its valent shell. But in the case of ethylene, which is C double bonded C with single bonds to H coming off of each of the carbon, if we focus in on one of the carbons, you'll see that it's making three bonding domains rather than four. So in other words, a central atom, and a ligand for that matter, will only hybridize the orbitals needed in order to achieve bonding. Since ethylene only needs three bonding domains, then it'll only hybridize three orbitals. So let's take carbon's four valence electrons and spread them out. You'll see that the first three go evenly into this sb2 hybridized orbital, and the fourth then hangs out in this 2p. Now, Offbau's principle suggests that we need to fill the lowest available energy level and orbital first. But in the case of hybridization, Offbau just kind of gets tossed out the window. So the three that you put in place in the sp2 hybridized orbitals go here, and the fourth then gets placed in this unhybridized p orbital up above, which is technically slightly higher energy and further from the nucleus. Do you see how the 2p orbitals are still listed in the same distance from the nucleus, but these three are slightly higher and promoted a little bit above the s, but slightly lower than the, the 2p on its left. Now these three unpaired electrons are now available to participate in bonding, and the bonding happens between two hydrogens and the other carbon. This helps explain the three ways that this central carbon will bond to the elements around it. Now you might be asking yourself, what's the significance of this unpaired p electron in the 2p orbital? And that will come up here in a little bit. This is a very important electron. It doesn't do nothing. It's definitely hanging out there for a reason and we'll address that here soon. Now you might be asking yourself, how do these hybridized and unhybridized orbitals look like if you were to draw them out? And the next slide will help illustrate that. But as this bullet point points out, the orientation of the unhybridized p orbital lies perpendicular to the plane of the three sp2 orbitals. Here, take a look at this picture. What you see in yellow is the three sp2 hybridized orbitals that we talked about in the last slide and the perpendicular purple p orbital is where that one extra electron is hanging out. Now this p orbital can fit up to two electrons in it but there's only one to put in there and so it has the freedom to roam both sides and at any given moment it might be on this side or it might be on that side but that doesn't really matter. What I'm trying to show you is the orientation in space of the hybridized orbitals in yellow and the unhybridized p orbital. Let's take a look at carbon one more time. But in this case, we're going to take a look at carbon in CO2 where there's only two domains on either side of the carbon. And since there's only two domains on either side of the carbon, we only need to hybridize two orbitals. So one of the s orbitals or the 1s orbital and one of the 2p orbitals. Again, I default to carbon written in the traditional quantum mechanical model as 2 in the 2s and 1 in each of the 2ps. But since I noticed that carbon is in the middle with domains on left and right, that's only two domains, so I only need to hybridize two orbitals. Of course, I'm going to hybridize the s because it's of the, the lowest energy and one of the 2p orbitals, which is where you get basically this setup over here. And now if I spread out the electrons in the following orbitals evenly according to Hund's rule, and again, as I mentioned, Aufbau's rule just gets kind of tossed out when you're discussing hybridization and filling orbitals 
of hybridized and unhybridized orbitals. So the four electrons get spread out evenly. And now these hybridized orbitals can account for the bonding domains on either side of the carbon. Now again, there's still unpaired electrons in the 2p unhybridized 2p. And we're definitely going to address that because some people at this point are wondering what the purpose of these are. And then trust me, they do serve a very important purpose. That purpose is outlined here in this last bullet point. The unhybridized p orbitals are, that are not used are used to do what we refer to as pi bonding. Now I'm going to preface this a little bit, but pi bonding happens anytime there are multiple bonds to the central atom. So if there's a pi bond, there is at least one unhybridized p orbital. And if there's a pi bond, it is part of a double or triple bond. In hybridization, the bonds are broken down into two types. The first of which is the sigma bond. Now the sigma bond is the standard bond of a hybridized orbital. Sigma bonds form when two overlapping hybridized orbitals touch one another. So any hybridized orbital, and I say SPX here because this could be an SP3 or an SP2 or an SP, any hybridized orbital will make a sigma bond. But if there are, there are any unhybridized p orbitals, for example, in an sp2 configuration or an sp, those p orbitals overlap with the p orbitals of the ligands to form what we refer to as pi bonds. In other words, any unhybridized p orbitals have the potential to make multiple bonds. Now, what do you mean when you say they overlap one another? Now, this is kind of hard to visualize. But basically, those vertical components of the p orbital and a vertical component of another p orbital stretch in and overlap one another on both the top and bottom. So a pi bond is an overlap of one p orbital. Even though there are two lobes of the p orbital, the top lobe and the bottom lobe respectively, any overlapping in the, both the top and the bottom result in one pi bond. So a double bond situation is characterized as one sigma with one pi. But a triple bond situation is one sigma and two pi bonds. So in summary, all domains bonding wise have a sigma bond. And if it's a multiple bond, it may include one or possibly two pi bonds. Here's an illustration of carbon dioxide, the one that we just talked about previously. And if you look over here, you'll see that it has two double bonds, one on each side of the carbon. So the hybridization with respect to the carbon in the middle is sp. But the hybridization with respect to the oxygens is sp2. And the reason I know this is because there are three domains around the oxygen. There is one bonding domain and two pairs of electrons, each counting as one domain. So it's got three domains. And so then the hybridization is sp2 because s1p2 adds up to be three. And it's sp2 also on this side. Now the sp orbitals for carbon are the ones in yellow. And so you've got the sp on the right and the sp on the left. The hybridized orbitals for each oxygen are colored in green. This is an sp2 and each one of these are sp2. So you've got an sp2 there and an sp2. Now same on the other side, sp2, sp2, and sp2. Now the blue ones that you see are unhybridized p orbitals. Remember, in an sp or an sp2 situation, there's unhybridized p orbitals that still remain on each element. Now as long as you have unhybridized p orbitals, in elements next to each other, they can and may form pi bonds. And a pi bond, and I'll highlight it, is the p orbital here, and it actually consists of this space in between those two unhybridized p orbitals. And it actually includes also the space underneath. And so this, this couple, this, these, these two brackets, 
are the pi bond. It's not two pi bonds, it's just one pi bond. One pi bond consists of overlapping p orbitals, one on top and one on the bottom. So it appears that these are triple bonded, one where the hybridized orbitals touch each other, which is a characteristic of a sigma bond, and the other two are actually one single pi bond. You just need to remember that. Two overlapping lobes of one p orbital equals one pi bond. Remembering that it's not a pi bond if only one of the elements in the molecule has an unhybridized p orbital. You need to have two elements next to each other that have unhybridized p orbitals in order for them to connect to form a pi bond. Now, of course, you're forming a sigma bond on the left-hand side, too. Anytime you've got hybridized orbitals touching nose to nose like this, it's signature sigma bond. But the pi bond is the unhybridized p orbitals connecting, and this one is happening behind in the background, and this one's happening in the foreground. But like before, these two lobes of overlapping p orbitals represents one pi bond. Here's a picture from our textbook which shows the difference between a sigma bond and a pi bond. In this case, on the left, you have hybridized orbitals touching nose to nose. This area right here that I'm pointing at is where the nucleus would be of a particular element and this would be its hybridized orbital, and this would be a nucleus with its hybridized orbital. And when two hybridized orbitals touch each other nose to nose, that forms a sigma bond. Now on the right-hand side here, we've got, again, the nuclei of two different elements on the left and on the right. And what you're not seeing is the unhybridized p orbitals that usually are sitting there. When they're not bonding, they're just sitting vertically top and bottom. But when they bond, they stretch in and meet each other in the middle. So they bend in and overlap. It seems really weird, and I don't doubt that it is really weird, but that is how we explain pi bonding. So here's a set of questions that you may encounter on a future quiz or a future test. More likely the test since, well, we took the quiz before we learned about hybridization. But these are the questions that you may be encountering in the future here. So we've got ethylene. You can see the structure down here. It's C2H4 with a double bond between the carbons. Now the first bullet point asks, what's the shape of the ethylene molecule? Well, you don't really have one true central atom, so you have to say with respect to which carbon you're looking at. So let's just call this the central carbon. And then you say that the shape with respect to the left-hand carbon would be trigonal planar. And since this molecule is symmetrical, meaning that it has the same look on both the left-hand carbon and the right-hand carbon, you can say that it's trigonal planar with respect to the other carbon as well. Next, what are the approximate bond angles around each of the carbon atoms? So we can zoom in on just one of the carbon atoms, and trigonal planar, even though it's not drawn that way currently, is all 120 degrees around each one. So this one's 120, this one's 120, and then the one up here where the arrow is, is also 120. Finally, the last question asks, why can't sp3 hybridization account for the ethylene molecule? Well, remember, in sp3 hybridization, the only time that would ever happen is if you have four single bonds around a central carbon, but you have two single bonds and one double bond. So because there's one double bond, sp3 cannot be used to account for the hybridization of the ethylene glycol molecule. Now let's talk about expansion of the octet, because if you can bring in some hybridization of the S and P orbitals, then why can't you hybridize some D orbitals as well? And this is exactly what happens and helps explain why certain elements can expand their octet. Now in previous lectures and previous video lessons, I talked about how certain elements can access a D orbital to expand their octet. And what I meant by that at the time, without telling you or without using the word hybridization, is that they have access to hybridize one or more of their d orbitals in that subshell that starts in the third energy level. Here's a sketch of the orbital box diagram for phosphorus. And phosphorus, we want to make five single bonds. But phosphorus doesn't have five unpaired electrons. You'll see that it has a pair of electrons in the s orbital. And this is a 3s, and this is a 3p. And it's one single electron in each of the 3p. 
And that's great if it has one single electron in each of the 3p, which means it can very easily account for three single bonds to phosphorus. But what you're not accounting for, or what you're not able to explain with this, is that phosphorus can make up to five bonds. So instead, what we do is we hybridize the s, the p, and the 3d orbital into five equal hybridized sp3d1 or sp3d orbitals. And when you do that, you can spread out the five electrons of phosphorus, one in each of these hybridized orbitals, and you leave four remaining unhybridized d orbitals available that just don't have any electrons in them. Now when you look at the Lewis dot structure, or I guess in the Vesper structure of phosphorus over here, you can see that there are five lobes, which represent in red here, five hybridized sp3d orbitals, and they overlap then with the four sp3 hybridized orbitals of chlorine, and they can form five single bonds to chlorine. And the largest hybridization, or the most complex we're going to talk about, is the sp3d2. So instead of just pulling in one of the d orbitals to hybridize, we pull in two of the d orbitals. So you take the s, the three p's, and two of the d's, and what you get is six hybridized orbitals. And this happens with sulfur. It also happens with elements that are underneath sulfur, like selenium. And it could also possibly happen with noble gases. The example that I'm going to use is xenon. Xenon here has four single bonds and two lone pairs on the central atom. Or in other words, it has access to 12 electrons. But we need to have a situation where we've got orbitals that are all of the same energy that can have single and, in some case, pairs of electrons in them. Four of the singles will bond, and then two of the pairs will remain in hybridized orbitals. They'll just remain unbonded. And what you get is a situation like this, all the way on the end here. You've got xenon with six lobes in pink, which represent the six hybridized sp3d2 orbitals. And then you see you've got a pair of electrons occupying one of the orbital, a pair of electrons occupying the other orbital, or, and the four remaining orbitals can perform some bonding because they have unpaired electrons in them. And so do the fluorines in that case, and they would have unpaired electrons in them, and then they overlap and they form sigma bonds. So I hope you can see by now how an element when you try to explain how it's bonding and how it's gaining electrons by expanding its octet, it pulls in some available orbitals and hybridizes them. It seems like it's something that's just magic, something that we made up after the fact to help account for it. And to be honest, I agree with you. It kind of sounds like that. It's something that we've created as chemists to help explain why things bond rather than them existing first and using the explanation second. We explain that first and justify their existence afterwards, which seems kind of backwards. And I agree. Again, it is. So I'm going to finish off this video lesson with a couple of summarizations. First of all, it's important that all bonds to the central atom have to have a hybridized orbital. In other words, if it's a sigma bond, it has to be a hybridized orbital. And we treat any future single bonds to a central atom as a sigma bond. Any unhybridized p orbitals can make pi bonds with a neighbor as long as that neighbor also has unhybridized p orbitals. And finally, on the AP test, the questions about hybridization are not really write a narrative explaining how hybridization occurs, or write a paragraph explaining how a hybridized orbital happens. What you'll really be asked on the AP test is trying to describe the hybridization of the central atom in a molecule. And so what you really do is you look at the domain geometry. The do domain geometry will tell you what the hybridization is, not the other way around. You don't figure out the hybridization then determine the domain geometry. You determine the domain geometry to determine the hybridization. So if you have a domain geometry that has two clouds, whether they be bonding clouds or pair, lone pair clouds, it is sp hybridization. If you have a trigonal planar domain geometry, it is sp2. Basically, three clouds hybridizes three orbitals. Four clouds in tetrahedral domain geometry hybridizes four orbitals. Five clouds hybridizes five orbitals. Six clouds hybridizes six orbitals. Now this column in the middle is only in there to tell you what possible molecular geometry shapes could exist when you have three clouds, or what shapes exist when you have four clouds. But really, as soon as you know the domain geometry, you can automatically predict 
the hybridization. And that's the extent of the questions that you'll be asked as it pertains to hybridization on my test and the AP test. So after about 20 minutes of a video lesson, this last slide just basically tells you if you can strictly memorize this fact, you'll be in good shape and you will not lose any points as it pertains to hybridization. But hopefully by sitting through this entire video lesson, you have a better understanding of why hybridization occurs and you have a better understanding of how it occurs by pulling in other orbitals of higher energy and making them all equivalent so that bonding can occur and it helps merge once again the idea of an electron configuration with Vesper because when looked at individually they don't coincide with one another they do not speak nicely they do not help each other in their existence but hybridization allows for both of them to exist so anyway that takes care of this video lesson thanks for listening